Um, so my goal this morning is to describe a validation study using a wearable sensor uh, for specific uh, determination of scratching and head shaking in dogs. Um, it's a study that was funded by AGL and I've worked as a consultant for the company. So we know that pruritus in uh, dogs is a very common presenting complaint in both veterinary dermatology uh, and in general practice. It comes in a variety of forms, scratching, head shaking, licking, chewing, rubbing, a variety of really creative things that our dogs sometimes do. The ongoing challenge that we have though is the assessment of pruritus. And what we're limited to so far is that this is a subjective assessment by owners. The obvious limitations are of variation between owners and how they might assess their dog's paritis. Um, a, a bit of a placebo effect in veterinary medicine. So a number of animals, you, uh, they simply come in and they want their uh, dogs to get better, uh, the, the owners do, and then others, uh, I feel like, are convinced that nothing's ever gonna work. So we've got both ends of the spectrum there. But the other big one for us, too, is time of observation. When we ask owners routinely uh, how itchy is their dog, then it's not uncommon for us to get that answer that they're going to work all day and, and see them for a limited period of time. So we have a lack of truly objective data, and uh, that would be uh, obviously a really good thing to have. So the quest for objective data brings us into wearable technology. And wearable technology, probably a decent percentage of the folks in this room uh, have one of these contraptions that they're wearing at the moment. It's become rather commonplace in, um, uh, in people. And a handful of our colleagues have looked at using some wearable technology to explore uh, objective measurement of paritis. Um, so far, these studies have measured mostly differences in overall activity between atopic and normal dogs. Uh, in these studies, the activity was determined by total voltage or uh, electronic uh, voltage generated over either 15 second blocks or one minute blocks. And they were done primarily during uh, non-exercise times when you wouldn't normally expect uh, activity ha to happen. The assumption is that basically during nighttime hours, if there's increased activity, that must be paritis, and especially when you compare the two groups of atopic and normal dogs. Uh, Dr. Plant later kind of confirmed this correlation by videotaping uh, some of these kennel dogs and observing that they were in fact scratching during those periods of time. But the limitations obviously are that this is a, an indirect uh, measurement of paritis relying on increased activity during non-active times. So the objective of this study was to validate the use of a high resolution multi-dimensional sensor to quantify specific paritic behaviors, and in this case, scratching and head shaking in dogs. The two main components of this study and of this approach is one, first a data, I mean a sensor, excuse me, that's capable of collecting data in enough detail that can provide a specific data fingerprint uh, to these behaviors. The other is uh, a computer analytics model that basically can interpret that data in order to identify those behaviors. So to provide examples of these behaviors, 361 dogs were used. Uh, of those, uh, two humane societies and one Durham referral practice with the division that you see there. Now with the humane societies, because multiple visits occurred here and some of the same dogs were present at subsequent visits, then a number of those guys were recorded more than once. And so in your abstract, the number should be uh, 573 total data collections instead of 573 dogs. Dogs were classified by size into these categories using toys, small, medium, uh, large, and giant. Um, of those divided by weight. And breeds were recorded in the majority of these cases. Now the Derm referral practice, these were breeds as identified by the owners. It's important to note that uh, the breeds were identified or really guessed at or approximated by the Humane Society staff, so they may be less accurate. And these are the lists, and uh, you can see that they're, they're rather long. What's more important, I think, though, is to look at the division of sizes of dogs uh, that might make a difference. So video recording was done using a handheld camera at the Humane Societies and using a tripod-mounted uh, 
uh, camera at the derm referral practice that was mounted on the countertop and left, left there during the duration of uh, an animal's visit. Um, a sensor was pre-attached to the collar and there was an intentional shaking of the sensor uh, at the beginning and the end of the video session in order to provide a timestamp uh, of sensor data when the uh, video started so that they could be synchronized later and I'll show you that. So once the video was obtained, it was imported from the camera into Elan Linguistic Software. Uh, this is a software that allows annotation, so you can make notes within that software after importing the video. And it, it was annotated separately by two different observers, and the common annotations were then combined and exported from the program. And this is the vocabulary that was used so that when each observer uh, made notes within the system, they did it with a consistent terminology so that they were all the same. And this is an example of the Elan software and what you can see is obviously the video at the top and then uh, down here is where you'll see the annotation. And by slowing these frames down, then the observers were able to specifically note when a behavior started and stopped in order to link that to the video data and later to the sensor data. So the sensor used was an AX3 uh, MEMS or micro electromechanical system three axis accelerometer. Uh, it measures acceleration in G's in X, Y, and Z axes and it has a flash onboard memory uh, to store that information. The critical features here are the frequency of data collection and the multi-dimensional nature of how that data is collected. So just to spend a second on why frequency of data collection is important. Uh, if we look at this original sinusoidal curve here, then if you were to use low frequency data collection and only collect data at, at a, an infrequent sampling rate, then you can see that you miss a lot of the details and instead of the sinusoidal curve, you might misrepresent it as a straight line. If instead you do a high frequency sampling rate, then you can see that not only do you capture all of those details, you have the ability to recreate that curve as well. So this is a real world example using some of the data from our dogs. And on the graphs above, these are 100 hertz, so that's 100 times per second sampling uh, for both scratching and running. And then 10 hertz, or 10 times per second sampling below. And the difference here you can see is fairly obvious that all of these data points are captured for scratching and for running in the higher frequency sampling. But if you only did low frequency sampling, then those two different graphs start to look fairly similar. So once the, uh, the sensor data was obtained, it too was imported into the Elan linguistic software. And this is where that uh, timestamp of actually shaking the sensor allowed both the video and the sensor data to be synchronized. And so you can see over here the numerical values for X, Y, and Z axis data as they occur. So once all of that information was combined, it's then exported from the Elan software into comma separated values and can be imported into programs like Excel. And the result is that you have columns for time to the hundredths of a second X, Y, and Z acceleration data, and then the annotations for what was happening during those time periods. A hundred rows of this would equal a one second time frame, and so those were combined and aggregated into a one second frame of data for each of these behaviors and each example. That converted data was then divided into three segments using training, testing, and validation. And the training data was used to help build a model, to help build the algorithm so that the system could understand what a behavior looked like. The testing data used to refine that algorithm so that once the original uh, algorithm was developed, the testing data applied to it and then provided suggestions with how the next generation might be improved. The validation data, once the final algorithm was chosen, was then used to test and come up with the results of how well uh, this system predicted or documented the behavior. So in order to develop these algorithms, the framework used was the Georgia Tech Multiple Objective Evolutionary Programming. And this is something that uses, it, it processes the data files through multiple generations of algorithm development uh, using genetic programming. And so genetic programming is a bio-inspired approach 
that allows the computer systems to create a set of rules uh, followed in the calculations or problem solving. And in this case, these algorithms were in, used to interpret future behaviors and future data. So this is an example of, of how the process works. So up at the top, you'll see algorithm creation. So the ori original algorithm is defined. It's then trained to understand what different behaviors look like and then tested using the testing data. And then based on the scores from that original, that information, uh, new algorithms and new generations were developed until they were refined and better and better. The challenge for us was to develop a system that has a high positive predictive value. And the important thing to realize is that scratching, head shaking, uh, behaviors of this nature are in the big picture rather rare events, meaning that they compared to walking, resting, running, they don't happen very often. So the positive predictive value here is the probability that an event did actually occur when we said it was detected. If we look at the examples here and talk about a probability of detection of 100%, but a false alarm, a false positive of 5%, compared to a probability of detection of 50% with a false alarm of only one one hundredth of a percent, we can see the differences when we apply this to shaking. So if we use shaking as our example, Shaking uh, encompassed 992 one-second frames out of over 114,000, so that makes it 0.8% of the overall data collected. If we use example A, while it de detected every one of those occurrences, because it misinterpreted 5% of the overall data, then you end up with a positive predictive value of only 13.88%. In contrast, if you look at the example B with a 50% detection rate and the low false alarm, the, then the positive predictive value is much higher. What that means is that we have really high confidence uh, with that second example that when the system says shaking occurred, it did in fact occur. So this is how kind of how the generations of uh, algorithm development work. This is called a Pareto frontier graph. And each of these uh, data points represents an algorithm and how well it performed. And based on that, and I'll show you one of these in motion in just a moment, but based on that, it defines how the new algorithm should then, been, then be developed. And so each of these lines represents a new generation. The goal in looking at this graph is that what we want is zero false alarm and 100% detection. So it drives this algorithm toward this lower left-hand corner. And to show you this in action, this is what it looks like. And so each of these data points, as the new algorithms are developed, is driving further and further toward that lower left-hand corner. And again, 100% detection and zero false alarms. So once the best algorithm candidate was selected, then the validation data, and again, that validation data was data that was separated and not used for any uh, of the previous training and testing. That data was used to then test the system and identify how well it performed which leads us to the important part, and, uh, and that's the results of, of doing so. So if we look at head shaking, the sensitivity, 72.16%, specificity, 99.78%. So what that means for us is that while you might miss a few episodes of head shaking, if the system says that head shaking occurred, our confidence is in incredibly high that it did in fact occur. In applying that similar philosophy that I explained in positive predictive values, if we consider that only 0.8% of the total data was head shaking, then that gives us a total accuracy of 99.56%. If we look at scratching, sensitivity 76.85% and specificity of 99.73%. And given that scratching made up a little over 2% of the total data, then our total accuracy is 99.24%. So our conclusions from this study is that the sensor and algorithm database um, are a viable and validated method of measuring scratching and head shaking in dogs. Uh, the, this tool has significant implications in both patient monitoring and research for paritis in dogs. And the ability of the overall system with the two components of data collection and algorithm interpretation has tremendous potential for further development of understanding additional behaviors and objective uh, measurement in veterinary medicine would certainly be welcome. 
So limitations for this study, the obvious ones is that uh, this only evaluated scratching and head shaking. Uh, other forms of paritis, including paw licking, chewing in various spots, uh, should also be defined for a more complete picture. Uh, 